I'm Alex Michelson. This week on The Issue is the sage from South Central wants to live in the White House. With us in studio, presidential candidate Larry Elder is here. Then, a different view from podcaster Brian Tyler Cohen, one of the top progressive voices online. The Issue Is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. Larry Elder has joined us in so many different roles here on The Issue Is before, but <laughs> never as a presidential candidate. So let's put some info on the screen, which is the first thing he wants you to do. This is elderforpresident.com is his website where you can donate and find out more information about his presidential campaign. Larry also has a new book coming out available for pre-order right now called As Goes California, where he recounts his time running for governor and talks about the Golden State as a sort of cautionary tale to the nation. Larry Elder, welcome back to The Issue Is. Great to see you. Thank you for having me, Alex. I appreciate it. All right, so we have hinted for years on this show now about this concept that you would run for president. Now you've made it official. You right. decided to actually do it. Right. Why are you doing it? You know, Alex, my father was in the military. My older brother, Kirk, was in the Navy. He was a Vietnam-era vet. Um, my little brother, Dennis, actually went to Vietnam in the Army. I'm the only one who didn't serve. And I've always felt bad about that. And I'm doing this, Alex, because I feel I need to give back to a country that's been so great to me and to my family. I would rather not spend my winters in Iowa. I'd rather not spend my winters in, uh, in New Hampshire. But I feel I have a moral, a patriotic, and a spiritual obligation to give back to a country that's been so great to me. That's why I'm doing this. And we've seen you out on the campaign trail. Uh, what's it like out there? What are you learning from the country? Well, um, I've been spending a lot of time in Iowa. I've learned that at the Iowa State Fair, they have pork chop on a stick, bacon on a, chick, on a stick, butter on a stick, and I've learned that you can gain 10 pounds and not lose it over the course of a year. <laughs> uh, it's just been um, exhilarating, uh, fun, hard, frustrating. The hard part is I've got to raise uh, a lot of money. I've got to raise at least money from at least 40,000 individual donors, and in 20 states, you have to have 200 donors uh, each. You're running against Donald Trump. How do you beat him? Here's how I see it, Alex. Republicans are of two minds about 45. There are those who love him, and there are those who love what he did as president, but fear, for reasons that I believe are unfair to him, that a sufficient number of swing voters in suburban states would not vote for the man if he walked on water. In fact, if he did, they say he can't swim. Now, the question is, if you like the America First agenda, and I do, for the most part, virtually everything he did, I agree with, but you want a vehicle who has not turned off suburban women, so that enough of them will vote for him in the swing states that will control this, this race. I'm your man. So you're essentially saying you're Trumpism without Trump. Uh, I would put it somewhat differently, but I, I've got no problem with that. Um, so even if he got the nominee, it sounds like you would be supportive of him. I'm going to support, support whoever he or she is. That's one of our problems. As you know, when I ran for governor, I did not say a single negative thing about any of my rivals. Unfortunately, they did not return the favor, but I intend to adhere to that. Uh, the, the, the goal here is to topple Biden-Harris. They have done incalculable damage to this country in the last two and a half years, and we need to win. You know, one of the, the big issues you talk about often that you want to bring to this is the idea of the importance of fathers Absolutely. in America. Mm -hmm. You've also talked a lot about your dad. We've got mm -hmm. a picture of him. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, right. but you've written beautifully about him in the past. What do you think your dad would think of his son running for president? He would be blown away. I gave a speech one time at the Ronald Reagan Library where I talked a little bit about my dad. As you know, he left home at the age of 13, never knew his biological father, which shows you it's not necessarily a death sentence, uh, and ended up cleaning toilets until I was 10 years old, started a little cafe when he was 47 years old, ran it until his early 80s. When he retired, he owned that property, the property next door to it, and the home that's still in our family. So my dad retired with a little less than a million dollars. So I told a little bit about my dad and my mom. My mom grew up on a farm in Huntsville, Alabama. Both of them are from the Jim Crow South. And Suddenly, I was interrupted by a standing ovation because I mentioned my mom and my dad are actually here. And they stopped my speech, they stood up, and they gave my parents a standing ovation. My speech is over, Alex. My first book had just come out, The Ten Things You Can't Say in America. And people were lining up behind my dad with pens in their hands, and my dad was signing my book at the Ronald Reagan Library. Only in America. Wow, mm -hmm. what, what a beautiful story. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit more about the campaign. You, you just posted a comment that somebody else posted as a comment on right. your social media. <laughs> right, right. Let's put that up on the screen so people can read it. It says, even if Larry Elder doesn't win the presidency, what he will say on the campaign trail will be thought-provoking, and he most definitely will should be a cabinet member. So 
what cabinet post would you like? Well, I'm running for president. I'm not running right. to be vice president. I'm not running for a cabinet position. I'm running to do a number of things. Obviously, I was a supporter of Donald Trump. I supported his policies on borders, on taxes, on, on reducing regulations, on getting tough with China. But I also want to bring to the forefront the issue, as you pointed out earlier, of fatherlessness. 40% of all American kids now into the world without a father in the home married to the mother. 70% in the black community. And Obama once said a kid raised without a father is five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in jail. Now the question is, how have we gone from having 25% of black kids entering the world without a father in the home married to the mother in 1965 to 70% today? And I argue it's the welfare state. We've incentivized women to marry the government. We've incentivized men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. The second issue is this lie that the Democrats keep promoting that America remains systemically racist. We all know that at one time it was, but it no longer is. This is a country that elected and re-elected the first black president, the only majority white country to ever do so. As we speak, the mayor's of America's three largest cities, New York, LA, Chicago, are all black. Isn't it possible that two things can be true at once? One, that it is impossible to be the exception to the rule and to be successful, as you have, as Barack Obama, Karen Bass, other people have. But two, the system itself is systemically racist and, and, and creates a, a situation where it's harder for you to be the exception to the rule. Uh, well, it's always harder if you don't have a father in the home. There are think tanks on the left, like the Brookings, and on the right, like the American Enterprise Institute. And they give the same formula to escape poverty. Graduate from high school. One presumably where you can read, write, and compute at grade yeah. level. All too often that's not happening, which is why I support school choice. Number two, don't have a kid until you're 20. Number three, get married first. Number four, get a job. And number five, avoid the criminal justice system. If you do that, you will not be poor. As we speak, Alex, there are Haitians lining up for a lottery to get into America because America is systemically racist? Nonsense. Nonsense. Uh, let's talk a, a little bit about your book. Y you break down sort of the behind the scenes of the recall. We were with you for basically every aspect of this. <laughs> I think I interviewed you more yeah, than you, anybody yeah, you else were, yes. on the campaign trail. You're, you're like so, Columbo, you're popping up all the yeah, time. Yeah. So what are we <laughs> going to learn in this book that we didn't already know? Uh, w what a grind it was. I mean, I got maybe four hours of sleep per day. We got in the race with eight weeks left. We did 100 events by event. I mean, either a print, radio, or TV interview, or a rally, or a fundraiser. Uh, it was a 90 mile an hour train that we were on. Yeah, and, and you also kind of write it as, as a cautionary tale about California as you're now running for president. Right. What do you think is the biggest thing that the nation should learn not to do because of what's happening in California. Do not have super majorities of Democrats in both chambers of the legislature the way we do here in California. The Democrats can pass any kind of job killing legislation that they want, pass any kind of tax hike that they want without a single vote from Republicans, and often they are, which is why people are leaving the state, which is why our average price of a home is 175 percent above the national average. I can go on and on and on. Do you think supermajorities are also bad in a place like Tennessee where they have a supermajority of Republicans? It depends on the quality of the policies. Uh, if you have a supermajority and you pass legislation to set up a panel for reparations, that's not a good idea. Um, obviously, you're not a big fan of, of Governor Newsom. You ran against no, him. Not. Although I don't think the two of you have ever actually met each we, other, we which not. is also an interesting thing. Well, one thing. of the reasons we haven't met is because yeah. a, a number of people in the media, hint, hint, did not pressure him to debate me. He was able to avoid debating me. We, we, and, offer, we offered him that opportunity. We offered you an opportunity to debate your, your opponents, too. And, and, that, and, that and was, if Mr. Newsom little, had shown yeah. up, I would have shown up. Uh, <laughs> but you can't force somebody to debate just like we couldn't force you to debate, too. You, just, you can extend the invitation. But do, do you think that... Um, Governor Newsom has a potential to be the president, uh, whether it be this time around or four years from now. I, I do. I mean, he's a good looking guy. Uh, in fact, you kind of look a little bit like him. <laughs> uh, he's a good looking guy. He's smooth. Uh, he survived the recall election. He's from the most populous state in the union. Uh, he's got a big war chest. Yes, but I think the rest of the country doesn't realize what a loon he is. He's a left wing California loon. And once the uh, American people realize who he is, I don't think he's electable. But is he nominatable? Yes. Um, we want to end with something kind of right. fun. Uh, you know we like to play <laughs> games here, so we're going to do our game called Personal Issues, where we get to know you as a candidate a little bit more and some of your cultural favorites. All right, you ready? Cultural favorites. Um, what is your favorite movie of all time? No Country for Old Men. Mm. Who's your favorite athlete of all time? I think that's got to be Bo Jackson. Uh, he's the best. Mm -hmm. uh, favorite actor? Robert Duvall. Uh, best part of being a Californian? The weather. No uh, question about it. Not the taxes. Who's your favorite? <laughs> the taxes. Who's yeah. your favorite Democrat, other than your family? Hubert Humphrey. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the favorite way to relax? Uh, watching a movie with my girlfriend, Nina. Very nice. Mm -hmm. All right, shout out did, to did, Nina. Did I, did I pass the inspection? I, I think you did. <laughs> right, I'm good. surprised you didn't say that Gloria Allred was your favorite Democrat, <laughs> who you often debate here on the issue is. So we'll have to bring that up the next time we right. see her. Mm -hmm. uh, up next, we're going to talk with Brian Tyler Cohen uh, with a different view. But we go to break with some music from Tina Turner, who we lost this week. And we love Tina Turner, great, right? Great Tina Turner. Yeah, uh, she's singing It's Only Love mm -hmm. Here. Right. Uh, stay with us. You're watching The Issue Is. Cheers to, cheers to Tina Turner. Yeah, hey, Tina. <laughs> just just water, everybody. Rest in peace, Tina. We're here today in the White House. Thank you, President Biden, for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you for wanting to speak to me. Of course, of course. And yet, our agenda has been moving slower. Here's Brian Tyler Cohen interviewing the President of the United States for his popular podcast and YouTube page. Recently, his YouTube hitting a milestone. Well, two things. And that's it. <laughs> two million subscribers. Oh, my God. Uh, okay. Two million well, subscribers to his subscribers. YouTube page. His individual videos often receiving millions of views like each among the highest engagement of any progressive right online. Right. Brian Tyler Cohen is here. Brian, welcome. Good to see you. By the way, you can stream new episodes of his podcast every week. We want to put up the information on the screen. It is called No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen. So, no lies today. You got to keep right. it 100. All right, let's Brian, do it. Brian, welcome back to the issue. It's Thanks good to so see much you. Thanks for having me. Uh, so uh, let's talk about what you're really good at is this idea of messaging. Clearly, you found a way to connect with millions and millions of people uh, in, in the digital space. And right now, Joe Biden's got a bit of a messaging problem. His polls show that his favorability is low. Uh, there are a lot of concerns about his age, people saying that we shouldn't have a president that's that old. What would your advice be in terms of the messaging for the Democratic Party to overcome uh, some of what are clear weaknesses? In terms of messaging, I think that initially people get so worried about Joe Biden's age, but this is binary. It's a choice between two people. And if we look at Joe Biden versus whoever the Republican candidate is, again, most likely Donald Trump, uh, it becomes a much clearer race in terms of, you know, not wanting to accept that extremism. And in terms of the messaging that you were alluding to before, I think it's pretty simple. It is that extremism. It's the extremism that Republicans have put forward in the form of abortion bans, LGBT bans, book bans, trying to slash earned benefits like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. They put it on full display in 2018, even to a higher degree in 2020, to a higher degree than that in 2022, and they're changing nothing as we head into 2024. But that's an argument against the other side. What's the argument for Joe Biden? Because don't you want to have a positive message? Yeah, of course. I mean, if you look at what Joe Biden's been able to accomplish in just two years in office, it's the most accomplished presidency that we've seen in our lifetimes. I mean, we're looking at the PACT Act, the CHIPS Act, which has led to an explosion of jobs in this country, the American Rescue Plan, the first gun safety bill in 30 years. We have uh, finally allowed the, go the government to negotiate lower drug prices, record um, climate investments. We have 12 and a half million jobs that have been added, the l unemployment rates at its lowest point in almost 50 years. I mean, that record speaks for itself. So in terms of the Republican race, because it's getting more crowded now. This week we saw new people entering it. Yeah. But it, it sort of starts with Donald Trump, right. Uh, who right now polls show is the leader. And obviously there are a lot of flaws with him electorally. But there's also this incredible strength that he has in terms of a connection with his base that seems unbreakable. The guy is a TV star. He's really good at debates. Uh, and he's good at putting his opponents in uncomfortable positions. Is there an argument that Donald Trump may be both the weakest and the strongest Republican nominee? Absolutely. I think for the same reasons that he's strong is exactly why he's weak. It is that very, you know, it's the, his boisterous nature, his whatever, all of, all of that, everything that is Donald Trump that brings all of his supporters to him, which is that, you know, 30 percent of the electorate that also pushes so many people away. Uh, so in terms of other candidates, Ron DeSantis entering the race this week, you know, his argument would be, uh, I don't have the baggage and the indictments, but I helped you out during COVID. If you're a Republican, you think he did a great job in Florida during COVID. Obviously, Governor Newsom has a different uh, approach here in California. Uh, what's the argument against Ron DeSantis? You have Ron DeSantis, who thus far has refused to display any semblance of strength, right? He refuses to throw even a single... Uh, punch against Trump. And so if you're trying to differentiate yourself from Trump 
and yet you're too afraid to actually do it, then I don't see how you're making that case to any of the voters, that I'm going to be the guy that can defeat him, and yet at the same time I'm too afraid to actually do anything to defeat him. And another potential candidate hasn't gotten in yet, but probably going to get in soon, is Mike Pence, who we talked to recently, uh, who's clearly got a, a close connection with the evangelical community, um, running on his religious conservatism. Uh, does Mike Pence have a shot? Or are you asking if there is a lane for Mike Pence in the Hang Mike Pence party? <laughs> or should, we, should we throw to those insurrectionists in front of the White House and with, a, with a gallows with Mike Pence's face painted on it yeah. and see, if, uh, see what they think about Mike Pence leading the Republican prim primary? So you don't think he's got a shot? I, but... I, I don't think that there is much of a lane for Mike Pence uh, in, in, a, in a party that was, uh, that was very willing to see him assassinated, no. Let, let's talk for a moment about uh, you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your backstory how you got into this and how you built this? Yeah, well, I had, uh, I had initially moved to LA to, to act and uh, did that for a little bit and uh, didn't exactly seem fulfilling going in for cars.com commercials and, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and hawking uh, Cheetos or whatever other, any, whatever other brands I was called in for, but um, was always interested in politics, organized a, 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 you know, to bring my whole campus down to the polling places when I was in college for Obama in 2008. Um, and uh, started writing some articles for, for HuffPost and eventually recognized that I wanted to do video content and that kind of married the, the political, you know, love for politics with, uh, with, with uh, my interest in, in being in front of the camera and uh, started a YouTube channel for nobody, really. I mean, 40 views, 50 views, 100, and, and just kept at it, kept doing it consistently and, and did whatever I think thought was right, did, did what I kind of put on display what I thought um, the message needed to be, and, and it kind of took off from there. You have uh, just a huge audience at this point, especially among um, black voters. You have an especially big audience. Why do you think people connect to what you're doing, and what are you doing differently than what everybody else is doing? Yeah, so I come at this from a different perspective in the sense that I don't have a background in D.C. I've only been to D.C three times maybe. One was to <laughs> interview the president in the White House. <laughs> so, um, you know, my background isn't in any of this stuff. And so when I, when I think about this stuff, I think about it in, in the way that a normal person would because, because we both don't have those backgrounds. Me and the rest of like, regular America don't have these backgrounds where it's, where it's just thought of in terms of, of, of political terms. So, so uh, you know, I think just taking like a common sense, no bullshit approach to all of this stuff is kind of, is kind of like what's, uh, what's been most interesting to people who watch it. Yeah, and, and Brian and I are very close, and, and I remember when you started your podcast, and, and we sort of were talking about that over lunch, and then it, it ends up with you at the White House interviewing the president. What was that experience like to be brought in as sort of an online guy and to be put face to face with the most powerful person on the planet? Yeah, it was, uh, I think it was the best day of my life. I mean, it was crazy <laughs> to be there. And I, and I didn't believe it was gonna happen until the moment that he walked into the room. And I knew, I mean, my heart was pounding sitting there because the leader of the, like you're in the center of the universe when that happens. Right. And uh, he walks in and I, I was telling myself, I just have to get the first question out and not flub the first question <laughs> and then I'll settle into the interview. And uh, able to get the first question out and, and we just spoke from there. But one interesting thing was like, uh, we had 15 minutes and we had somebody behind him counting me down. And so I was constantly hyper aware of the person in the background sure. counting me down. And Joe Biden has a tendency to be a little long winded. And, uh, and so I remember asking him my first question and he went on on a tangent and I felt the minutes counting down in my head, three, four, five, six, seven minutes. And uh, after his first answer was done, we were more than a third of the way through the interview. And I'm just like <laughs> reshuffling the questions in my mind. But how do you interrupt the president of the United States? You just got to, he, when he's done talking is when, is when the answer's over. Yeah. And so, uh, so that, was the, uh, that was the interesting part. But you, 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 learn, you learn little ways to you know, move yeah. the conversation forward and whatnot. Other than Joe Biden, who is your favorite guest on the podcast? Well, I have, I have a, a great time when Alex Michelson <laughs> comes on the podcast because I'll tell you what, it's the one time where you don't get talking points. It is just a fun, normal, casual conversation. Um, so that's my, that's my very diplomatic answer there. Oh, that's smart. I mean, yeah. that, that is, it makes sense to bring that. No, well, th I, am, I think I'm your most frequent you guest. most frequent guest. Uh, on the yeah. show. We have and, a great I, time. So I, people should check out the No Lie podcast or some of our past conversations. Yeah. And you can see me in a t-shirt. <laughs> um, all right. Well, you're now on our show. So we're going to do our personal issues game. This okay. is where we put 30 seconds up on the clock and we get to know you a little better because cultural favorites is what you're all about. Okay, so uh, let's start with this, if we can. Uh, Brian Tyler Cohen, what is your favorite 
movie of all time? Oh, Forrest Gump. What is your, who is your favorite band or musician? I'd say, uh, I'd say Pretty Lights. Who is your DJ. favorite He's a DJ. comedian? Favorite comedian. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm, I, I don't know if he, de if he, if he falls into the comedian category, but I've been an Adam Sandler fan forever, so. Yeah, sure. Uh, best way to relax. Oh man, I'll let you know, I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, watching a movie, right? Yeah, Maybe watching go. a movie, we'll, we'll, something we'll go, like that. We'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, all right, well, uh, you're, you're, you're proud Californian now, but where are you from originally? From New Jersey originally. New Jersey, so, so we're gonna play some music. I think New Jersey's greatest son, other than you. Bruce. Bruce. Yep. So we're taking you out with Thunder Road. Brian Tyler Cohen, everybody, No Lie Podcast. Uh, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having More me. More of the issue is when we come back. Great job. Nicely done. <laughs> One day we'll come back. A new poll from Berkeley IGS shows 67% of California voters think Senator Dianne Feinstein is unfit to serve in the Senate. 42% wanted to resign. Only 29% approve of the job she is doing. Next week on The Issue Is, we talk with one of the leading candidates hoping to replace Senator Feinstein at the end of her term. Congresswoman Barbara Lee will be back with us in studio. Plus, a debate between Ethan Bierman on the left and Tommy Lahren on the right. We'll wrap things up for this week after this. This week, we lost the queen of rock and roll, Tina Turner. Her brilliant talent, was matched by her bravery and resilience off screen as she overcame domestic violence. She was also a woman in her prime into her 80s. Tina Turner was simply the best. You're simply the best. Than all the rest. Tina Turner was 83. We'll see you next week for more of the issues.